so let's begin. Um, I'll just quickly go over the, the overhead. Uh, all the psalms uh, are sung really by Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, he, we can find him in every psalm, but some of them are messianic psalms, and they are psalms, I think they're about 16, because they absolutely paint a picture and a portrait of Jesus Christ. But Psalm 40, and I, I struggled with these a lot because, and other people did too, I think, and other commentaries do too, because Psalm 40 seemed to me really to be a psalm of David, particularly because he talked about all of his sins. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ had no sins of his own ever. The only sins he had were the sins he carried for us, and they were all ours. He was never sinful. And uh, so I call Psalm 40 the song the saved one sings, which starts very much like the psalm and the song that the Savior sang, except uh, that the Savior goes all the way through and really experiences death. And uh, then Psalm 22 is the song the Savior sings. And I thought that the different choruses in the songs were that agony would cry uh, the song, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And praise will sing praise to the Lord. And both of these psalms did say those things. And But victory shouts it is finished. And the only victor we have, the only one who has caused the victory it is finished, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So let's pray before we begin with these. Father, we thank you for the victory, and we want to remember always that uh, you have caused this 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 life of ours to be one that can be an eternal life because we believe in you. And Father, we would pray in, in our groups here and in our lives elsewhere that we would not forget that, that we would look to you as the Savior and we'll always say, no wonder they called you Savior. You saved us from our sins. So Father, bless us and again, just bypass uh, my heart and and uh, everything else just to, to bring to the people those things that you want me to say, Father, from my lips. Be from your lips. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The, um, David wrote, we know, I'm kind of seeing this for some reason, and I, it's distracting me. Uh, David wrote um, this psalm, we know. We don't know if the time is because uh, he was the object of Saul's hate. Remember, we've studied that this year, or it was the time of Absalom's rebellion. But it's a, it's a time when he is crying out and crying out to God. And, you know, we, we're learning that we're not uncertain about God at all. But the thing that we are uncertain about is what God is going to do next. We don't know what God is going to do next. But we're not uncertain about him. In fact, the worse the trials, and the devil hates this, the worse the trials, the greater, the, the more awful things happen, the more we realize that if we don't have faith in the Lord Jesus, we don't have anything. And so finally, it takes some time, but it will draw us closer. And we just need to keep coming, and we just need to keep praying, and, and keep praying. Don't wait until... We have to pray. Remember, I keep saying this every week, we want the spirit of prayer, not the habit of prayer, the spirit of prayer. So whatever we're doing, we can feel we have prayed together. Uh, Chuck Swindoll in his book, Growing Strong in the Seasons of Life, has a wonderful little thing called Final Descent, Commence Prayer. The following incident took place in 1968 on an airliner bound for New York. It was a routine flight and normally a boring affair. The kind of flights I like, uneventful. But, the one, but this one proved to be otherwise. Descending to the destination, the pilot realized the landing gear refused to engage. He worked the controls back and forth, trying again and again to make the gear lock down into place. No success. He then asked the control tower for instructions as he circled the landing field. Responding to the crisis, airport personnel sprayed the runway with foam as fire trucks and other emergency vehicles moved into position. Disaster was only minutes away. 
The passengers, meanwhile, were told of each maneuver in that calm, cheery voice that pilots manage to use at times like this. Very suspicious, huh? Those calm, cheery voices. Flight attendants glided about the cabin with an air of cool reserve. Passengers were told to place their heads between their knees, because that's the position, you know, to, to, for you to be able to have the best landing. Place their heads between their knees, grab their ankles just before the impact. It was one of those I can't believe this is happening to me experiences. There were tears, no doubt, and a few screams of despair. The landing was now seconds away. Suddenly, the pilot announced over the intercom, quote, we are beginning our final descent. At this moment, in accordance with the International Aviation Codes established at Geneva, it is my obligation to inform you that if you believe in God, you should commence prayer. You should commence prayer. Finally, finally, we commence prayer. When everything else, it's too late for anything else. And that's what we see in the Psalms, that we want to keep praying. We want to keep praying. So let's look at Psalm 40. We know that uh, sometimes doing God's will means that uh, we're going to have to wait patiently. Uh, and David did here. This is kind of David's testimony. You know, if we love God and we serve him, we give our testimony. And this is what David did. And this is not a five-minute bus stop wait, you realize, that he has to wait and wait and wait. The old three times, wait, wait, wait. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Sooner or later, he knows God comes through. And sooner or later, we know he does too. But things are happening all the time. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. And you know, we talked about our pits, didn't we, in our classes today. And some people said, I didn't like that question because I don't like to look back and think about the pit. I don't want to... to uh, Think about the bad things. I just want to go on and trust God. And that sounds wonderful, but some of us liked it. I like to talk about my pit. And, you know, the, the devil knows what my pit is. That's where he attacks me. And I love the next question where it said, well, tell God you don't want to have this going on in your life. Deal with your pit. You know, and I'll tell you that my pit and, and the whole world knows that I cannot handle strife in my family. I can't. I mean, I nearly go under I can't handle it. It's just, and you know, I thought about that. I was thinking I was up at 2.48 this morning because God woke me up to tell me some things. And, and I, I got up and I thought, well, it should be hard for us to handle strife in our family. Do you think that God likes strife in his family? That's probably about the most godly thing I have in my life, that I don't want strife in my family. So I don't even know if that's a pit. But I don't like being there. But I don't think God likes being there. And he lifted me out of this, and he put my feet on a rock. Now, the, we know the rock that we have is Jesus Christ. We know that. Remember in the, uh, one, of the, my, one of my favorite verses, and we studied last year when we did Luke, and um, we went to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. We looked at them all. When Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And then Jesus said this. He said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. He said, for flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven revealed that to you. And then he said, and I tell you, Peter, on this rock, on this chunk of truth, because that's what it is, it's the truth, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that rock, that firm foundation, that truth of knowing that God is the one who lifts you out of that pit and stands you there and gives you a firm place to stand, an absolute firm place to stand. That's where Jesus Christ wants to put us. And as soon as this happens, 
after he's lifted out of this quicksand that wants his life. I mean, he's going oh, no, like this. I, it's so scary to see movies with quicksand. I just I always go, oh, they'll never get him out. And sometimes they don't, you know, if it's a bad movie, I guess. But, but, but that's what it is. It'll just suck you down. It wants your life. It wants your hope. It wants everything. But when God lifts you out of that suction of that, and he puts you there, the first thing we need to do is exactly what the psalmist did. Sing a song. It says, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And you know, I said, it's out of the mire into the choir. <laughs> really, out of the mire into the choir, sing. You know, I don't care what's happening. And you don't want to sing sometime when you're in the mire. But there is scripture that says, put on, put, um, uh, for a spirit of heaviness, um, Put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. So sometimes when it's really bad and you think you're going to die, you're sure you're going to die, you may even think you're dead, you want to just sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. I mean, you want to sing anything. Just grab it. And your voice may shake and your tears may come, but you're going to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. You're going to just have something that comes, a verse that you can sing, because for some reason, the devil can't stand it. He hates that music. And you know why? Because of the Psalms. Because God showed us that Psalms were so important when we're depressed and when we're sad and when things are going wrong and when things are going right, incidentally. It's good to sing. And so uh, the Psalmist goes on. And he says, many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders, the wonderful works, the variety of works you have for us. And you know, Psalm 139, I don't know if you remember this verse. I love this. God's thoughts toward me are more than all the grains of sand. Do you remember that? I mean, he really cares what's happening. And he says, the things you plan for us to do, no one recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Do you know that the things that God has planned, the things that Jesus has planned, are endless for us? And do you remember that one verse in John 21? It says, Jesus did many other things as well, more things than these, that, event, that if every one of them were written down, well, I suppose, John says, the world isn't big enough to contain all the books. Where do you think those books are? if they were written down. I mean, the clowns get to heaven. You, whoever gets there first, run in and say, do you have books of everything Jesus has done? I think we will have those. And then it went on, he went on to talk about, I know that you don't want sacrifice and offering. Now Jesus, or God had said in the Old Testament, he required some sacrifice and he required some, some burnt offering. But you know, those were, those were sin coverings. They never did get rid of the sin. They almost just held them until Jesus came. It was that thing that we talked about last week about we had a, a debit card, it is really, the Visa card over here in the Old Testament. They charged them up and they stacked them up and they covered them with burnt offerings. And Jesus came and he took them all away and he gave us a birth certificate. A birth certificate, well, he did that too. He gave us a gift certificate to cover our sins. So ours were covered even in advance. And so he said, God wants our heart. We, we turned to Hebrews 10 this week, and we talked about how that's really what he wants. He is the sacrifice. Jesus Christ sacrificed once and for all. And we move on, too, and he says, I desire to do your will. And I think 6, 7, and 8 are considered to be David's coronation verses. And uh, he said, I desire to do your will, oh, my God, your law is within my heart. And do you know that's all? That's all we need is the desire to do his will. Let the will of your heart, oh God, be the will of my heart. Let the will of your heart even be the will of my head, my whole being. And we think about those, those two gardens always whenever we do anything about the crucifixion. We think about those two gardens, one the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane, where we had two different people, the first and the second Adam. And in the Garden of Eden, Adam took the fruit from the hand of Eve. 
and brought sin into the world for all of us. Because of his disobedience and his willfulness. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ took the cup from the hand of God and he took it because of his obedience and that he desired to do the will of his Father. And he brought salvation into the world for every one of us. And that's why will is so important, to desire to have a will to serve God, to love God, and then let him do the rest. We call out to him, we cry to him. That's all our part is. He says, then let me do my stuff. I'll do my stuff for you. Do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak, uh, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. Verse 10 says, I speak of your faithfulness. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Do you know your testimony needs to be spoken? It needs to be shared. And, you, and we need to learn to say it simply. Uh, my, my testimony takes a day and a half. That's why you never hear it. Because I have to give every detail. I have to tell what people were wearing and where we were sitting and what we had at brunch. And I, it's too wordy. And you know, one of the most powerful testimonies in all of Scripture, I think, is when the blind man was healed. And they said to him, they tried to get him to, to get Jesus in trouble as though he could. And he said, listen, fellas, all I know is once I was blind, and now I see. Now, on my fingers, that's eight words. Once my life was empty, and now Jesus filled it. Once I had nothing to live for, and now I am so excited I'm going to live for all eternity. And the questions then come from the people whose hearts have been prepared, who want to know more. Maybe they don't want to know more yet, but they will remember once I was blind and now I see. He goes on and he talks about his troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me. That's why I'm so sure that this is not a, as truly a messianic psalm, but there are some good things in it. And I cannot see there are more than the hairs of my head. Now, we love it that here he says, my sins are more than the numbers on my head. The head. So let's begin. Um, I'll just quickly go over the, the overhead. Uh, all the songs uh, are sung really by Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, he, we can find him in every psalm, but some of them are messianic psalms, and they are psalms, I think they're about 16, because they absolutely paint a picture and a portrait of Jesus Christ. But Psalm 40, and I, I struggled with these a lot because, and other people did too, I think, and other commentaries do too, because Psalm 40 seemed to me really to be a psalm of David, particularly because he talked about all of his sins. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ had no sins of his own ever. The only sins he had were the sins he carried for us, and they were all ours. He was never sinful. And uh, so I call Psalm 40 the song the saved one sings, which starts very much like the psalm and the song that the Savior sang, except uh, that the Savior goes all the way through and really experiences death. And uh, then Psalm 22 is the song the Savior sings. And I thought that the different choruses in the songs were that agony would cry uh, the song, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
and praise will sing praise to the Lord. And both of these songs did say those things. And But victory shouts it is finished. And the only victor we have, the only one who has caused the victory it is finished is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So let's pray before we begin with these. Father, we thank you for the victory and we want to remember always that uh, you have caused this, this, this life of ours to be one that can be an eternal life because we believe in you. And Father, we would pray in, in our groups here and in our lives elsewhere that we would not forget that, that we would look to you as the Savior and we'll always say, no wonder they called you Savior. You saved us from our sins. So, Father, bless us and, again, just bypass uh, my heart and, and uh, everything else just to, to bring to the people those things that you want me to say, Father, from my lips. Be from your lips. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The, um, David wrote, you know, I'm kind of seeing this. Uh, David wrote um, this psalm, we know. We don't know if the time is because uh, he was the object of Saul's hate. Remember, we've studied that this year, or it was the time of Absalom's rebellion. But it's a, it's a time when he is crying out and crying out to God. And, you know, we, we're learning that we're not uncertain about God at all. But the thing that we are uncertain about is what God is going to do next. We don't know what God is going to do next, but we're not uncertain about him. In fact, the worse the trials, and the devil hates this, the worse the trials, the greater, the, the more awful things happen, the more we realize that if we don't have faith in the Lord Jesus, we don't have anything. And so finally, it takes some time, but it will draw us closer. And we just need to keep coming, and we just need to keep praying, and, and keep praying. Don't wait until we have to pray. Remember, I keep saying this every week, we want the spirit of prayer, not the habit of prayer, the spirit of prayer. So whatever we're doing, we can feel we have prayed together. Um, Chuck Swindoll in his book, Growing Strong in the Seasons of Life, has a wonderful little thing called Final Descent, Commence Prayer. The following incident took place in 1968 on an airliner bound for New York. It was a routine flight and normally a boring affair. The kind of flights I like, uneventful. But the one, but this one proved to be otherwise. Descending to the destination, the pilot realized the landing gear refused to engage. He worked the controls back and forth, trying again and again to make the gear lock down into place. No success. He then asked the control tower for instructions as he circled the landing field. Responding to the crisis, airport personnel sprayed the runway with foam as fire trucks and other emergency vehicles moved into position. Disaster was only minutes away. The passengers, meanwhile, were told of each maneuver in that calm, cheery voice that pilots manage to use at times like this. Very suspicious, huh? Those calm, cheery voices. Flight attendants glided about the cabin with an air of cool reserve. Passengers were told to place their heads between their knees, because that's the position, you know, to, to, for you to be able to have the best landing. Place their heads between their knees, grab their ankles just before the impact. It was one of those, I can't believe this is happening to me experiences. There were tears, no doubt, and a few screams of despair. The landing was now seconds away. Suddenly, the pilot announced over the intercom, quote, we are beginning our final descent. At this moment, in accordance with the International Aviation Codes established at Geneva, it is my obligation to inform you that if you believe in God, you should commence prayer. You should commence prayer. Finally, finally, we commence prayer. When everything else, it's too late for anything else. And that's what we see in the Psalms, that we want to keep praying. We want to keep praying. So let's look at Psalm 40. 
we know that uh, sometimes doing God's will means that uh, we're going to have to wait patiently. Uh, and David did here. This is kind of David's testimony. You know, if we love God and we serve him, we give our testimony. And this is what David did. And this is not a five-minute bus stop wait, you realize, that he has to wait and wait and wait. The old three times, wait, wait, wait. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Sooner or later, he knows God comes through. And sooner or later, we know he does too, but things are happening all the time. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. And you know, we talked about our pits, didn't we, in our classes today. And some people said, I didn't like that question because I don't like to look back and think about the pit. I don't want to, to uh, think about the bad things. I just want to go on and trust God. And that sounds wonderful, but some of us liked it. I like to talk about my pit. And, you know, the, the devil knows what my pit is. That's where he attacks me. And I love the next question where it said, well, tell God you don't want to have this going on in your life. Deal with your pit. You know, and I'll tell you that my pit and, and the whole world knows that I cannot handle strife in my family. I can't. I mean, I nearly go under. I can't handle it. It's just, and you know, I thought about that. I was thinking I was up at 248 this morning because God woke me up to tell me some things. And, and I, I got up and I thought, well, it should be hard for us to handle strife in our family. Do you think that God likes strife in his family? That's probably about the most godly thing I have in my life, that I don't want a strike in my family. So I don't even know if that's a pit. But I don't like being there. But I don't think God likes being there. And he lifted me out of this, and he put my feet on a rock. Now, the, we know the rock that we have is Jesus Christ. We know that. Remember in the, uh, one of the... My, one of my favorite verses, and we studied last year when we did Luke, um, we went to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, we looked at them all. When Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said this, he said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. He said, for flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven reveal that to you. And then he said, and I tell you, Peter, on this rock, on this chunk of truth, because that's what it is, it's the truth, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that rock, that firm foundation, that truth of knowing that God is the one who lifts you out of that pit and stands you there and gives you a firm place to stand an absolute firm place to stand. That's where Jesus Christ wants to put us. And as soon as this happens, after he's lifted out of this quicksand that wants his life, I mean, oh, not like this. I, it's so scary to see movies with quicksand. I just I always go, oh, they'll never get him out. And sometimes they don't, you know, if it's a bad movie, I guess. But, but, but that's what it is. It'll just suck you down. It wants your life. It wants your hope. It wants everything. But when God lifts you out of that suction of that and he puts you there, the first thing we need to do is exactly what the psalmist did. Sing a song. It says, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And you know, I said, it's out of the mire into the choir. Really, out of the mire, into the choir, sing. You know, I don't care what's happening, and you don't want to sing sometime when you're in the mire. But there is scripture that says, put on, put, um, uh, for a spirit of heaviness, um, put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. So sometimes when it's really bad, and you think you're going to die, you're sure you're going to die, you may even think you're dead, you want to just sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. I mean, you want to sing anything, just grab it. And your voice may shake and your tears may come, but you're going to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. You're going to just have something that comes, a verse that you can sing, because 
For some reason, the devil can't stand it. He hates that music. And you know why? Because of the Psalms. Because God showed us that Psalms were so important when we're depressed and when we're sad and when things are going wrong and when things are going right, incidentally. It's good to sing. And so uh, the psalmist goes on and he says, Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders, the wonderful works, the variety of works you have for us. And you know, Psalm 139, I don't know if you remember this verse. I love this. God's thoughts toward me are more than all the grains of sand. Do you remember that? I mean, he really cares what's happening. And he says, the things you plan for us to do, no one recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Do you know that the things that God has planned, the things that Jesus has planned, are endless for us? And do you remember that one verse in John 21? It says, Jesus did many other things as well, more things than these, that that if every one of them were written down, well, I suppose, John says, the world isn't big enough to contain all the books. Where do you think those books are if they were written down? When the clowns get to heaven, whoever gets there first, run in and say, do you have books of everything Jesus has done? I think we will have those. And then it went on, he went on to talk about, I know that you don't want sacrifice and offering. Now Jesus, or God had said in the Old Testament, he required some sacrifice and he required some, some burnt offering. But you know, those were, those were sin coverings. They never did get rid of the sin. They almost just held them until Jesus came. It was that thing that we talked about last week about we had a debit card, it is, really. The Visa card over here in the Old Testament. They charged them up and they stacked them up. And they covered them with burnt offerings. And Jesus came and he took them all away. And he gave us a birth certificate. A birth certificate, well, he did that too. He gave us a gift certificate to cover our sins. So ours were covered even in advance. And so he said... God wants our heart. We, we turned to Hebrews 10 this week and we talked about how that's really what he wants. He is the sacrifice. Jesus Christ sacrificed once and for all. And we move on to, and he says, I desire to do your will. And I think 6, 7, and 8 are considered to be David's coronation verses. And uh, he said, I desire to do your will, oh my God. Your law is within my heart. And do you know that's all? That's all we need is the desire to do his will. Let the will of your heart, O oh God, be the will of my heart. Let the will of your heart even be the will of my head, my whole being. And we think about those, those two gardens always whenever we do anything about the crucifixion. We think about those two gardens, one the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane, where we had two different people, the first and the second Adam. And in the Garden of Eden, Adam took the fruit from the hand of Eve and brought sin into the world for all of us. Because of his disobedience and his willfulness. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ took the cup from the hand of God and he took it because of his obedience and that he desired to do the will of his Father. And he brought salvation into the world for every one of us. And that's why will is so important, to desire to have a will to serve God, to love God, and then let him do the rest. We call out to him, we cry to him. That's all our part is. He says, then let me do my stuff. I'll do my stuff for you. Do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak, uh, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. Verse 10 says, I speak of your faithfulness. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Do you know your testimony needs to be spoken? It needs to be shared. And, and we need to learn to say it simply. Uh, my, my testimony takes a day and a half. That's why you never hear it. Because I have to give every detail. I have to tell what people were wearing and where we were sitting and what we had at brunch. And I, it's too wordy. And you know, one of the most powerful testimonies in all of Scripture, I think, is when the blind man was healed. 
And they said to him, they tried to get him to, to get Jesus in trouble as though he could. And he said, listen, fellas, all I know is once I was blind and now I see. Now, my finger that's eight words. Once my life was empty and now Jesus filled it. Once I had nothing to live for. And now I am so excited. I'm going to live for all eternity. And the questions then come from the people whose hearts have been prepared, who want to know more. Maybe they don't want to know more yet, but they will remember once I was blind and now I see. He goes on and he talks about his troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me. That's why I'm so sure that this is not a, as truly a messianic psalm, but there are some good things in it. And I cannot see there are more than the hairs of my head. And he wants to account for every one of our sins. When he died on the cross, he said, I don't care how many billions of sins you have. I'm going to carry them for you. I am going to take those for you. All of those will be accounted for, and you won't have to worry about it forever. And then he says, be pleased, O Lord, to save me. Come quickly. And also, uh, verse uh, 15, I like very much. It says, may those who say to me, aha, aha, he says, be appalled at their own shame. And, uh, you know, people say that to us, don't they? We've had some difficult times. I mean, uh, people will say, where was your God when? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Where was your God? Where was your God when uh, the Sujis lost both their children in a year and a half? What kind of God do you have? But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Because again, we're not uncertain about God. But we are not certain about why that happened. I don't think you'll ever be, nor will I. In the kingdom of heaven, we may not have that answer. But we do understand that our God was right here. Yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. And I like that, that he says I'm needy. I, I, I am needy. Someone said to me yesterday, are you happy? And I said, what a nice thing to ask. I don't know that people ask me that. And I said, you know, I'm not very happy today. It's wonderful. It was just wonderful. It was like a confession. And you know, we don't want to, we don't want to let people know how needy we are. We, we've got this thing, this prideful thing that what will other people think? And do you know something? You'd be really surprised to find out how little people think about you. Really. You'd stop worrying about what they thought if you realized they don't think about us all the time. You don't think about me every day, do you? No. I mean, you probably think about me Wednesday, maybe, if I'm here. But, you know, I don't have to worry about what people are going to think. I must be concerned about what my Savior thinks. And that's pretty much what this psalm was about to me. Let's turn to Psalm 22 and uh, talk about Christ in all the psalms very quickly. I think we've sort of talked about that. This is the song that really is the Savior's dying cry. And something about Psalm 22, we're just on holy ground. I mean, it's as holy as it can be. If you look through the psalm here, I think you'll find, even in bits and pieces, you'll see the, the seven last words uh, you'll see, uh, here you'll see, uh, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me in verse 1? Uh, if you move your hand down a little bit to um, 2, uh, verse um, 7 and 8, you're going to see, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Verse 9 and 10, Jesus begins to talk about his mother. And, you know, he talked about his mother on the cross. He says, a woman, behold thy son. Son, behold, I will. And then, then if we move down for verse 15, we see, I thirst. I thirst. You know, it's possible that Jesus used this entire psalm at the crucifixion. Several, several good commentaries said that. 
Um, we go to uh, Father, into thy hands. I commend my spirit. I love it. He says, deliver my life from the sword, my precious life. Uh, in one translation, I think King James says, my darling life. My darling life, which really means my only life. He had only one life to give for us. He couldn't go back and come back as a cat or a dog or another person. He had one darling life. And then, uh, of course, we have um, the sixth one would be, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, verse 25 and 26, because from you comes the theme of my praise. Uh, the poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. And then, of course, we end up with, it is finished, uh, the seventh last word of Christ in verse 31. So if you spend some time with those, you'll see some wonderful things there. And it's a beautiful, beautiful psalm. It scares me a lot to talk about it because you want so much not to, to, to teach wrong, but it, it, I think it's pretty much says so much so strongly, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Well, we know that answer. I know the answer. I know why Jesus Christ was forsaken on the cross. So that I would never be forsaken. Because he said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. It's already been done. It happened to him. And he was sinless. He was pure. He had never done anything ever wrong in his entire life here on earth or before. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him sin who knew no sin, even though he was sinless. Even though he was sinless. It's always heavy for me, isn't it, for you? And Jesus Christ is the one who God said, remember when he was baptized, he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He was the only one, Jesus Christ, the only one God could use to carry our sins. My God, I cry out day and night, but you do not answer. And his heart beat, I think, really then, just until that darkness, too, at noon. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy, Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. And Jesus Christ calls out in two verses, and then for the rest of it, he just tells the story and he talks about the Father because he knows the Father's goodness. And he did not let the outward circumstances change what his work was to do, what he was supposed to be doing for the Father or for us. He continued on the path. And we talked about that too, is while we wait, keep on keeping on and doing what we need to do. Jesus continued to pray. He said, if, if you are Father's, if in you our fathers put their trust, they trusted and you delivered them. And that's important for all of us to remember. What he's done before, he will do again. They cried to you and they were saved and they were delivered. But in you they trusted and they were not disappointed. Now, he was not delivered so that we could be again. He was not forsaken so that we wouldn't, he was forsaken so we would not be forsaken. And he was not saved and, de and delivered so that we could be saved. Verse 6 says, but I am a worm. And that's as low as you can get, isn't it? Isn't it? And not a man scorned by men and despised by the people. Do you know that the word for worm there is cocus, C-O-C-C-U-S. And it's a bug that hung on plants. And they used to take this bug and they would crush it to get a red, a scarlet dye. It's interesting, isn't it? Isaiah 1, 8 says uh, that your sins, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And we think of that as being, of Jesus Christ being crushed and the worm and the, and the blood, the blood but but the scarlet sins being squeezed out of him. Our sins being squeezed out. And then you can't help but think of the blood that covers it. How wonderful that we have these word things to play with. And also he says, I'm not a man. Well, he was and he wasn't. He was a savior. 
He was altogether human and altogether divine. But Isaiah 52, 14 says, he had a face so marred that he was not recognizable as a man anymore. That with the cross, with the, the nails and the blood running, but with the, the um, crown of thorns digging deeply into him, the beating he had had. Do you know, we, we watched the beating of... Um, who was the, the police, when the policeman beat the mud? Rodney King. And you know, we were so appalled at that. Whether we thought Rodney King should have been caught and apprehended, we, were, we, we just we kept saying, are they really beating him? Oh, mercy, my, are they really? What are they doing? And, I mean, you know, the whole world was worried about Rodney King and the policeman. And yet... They did this to the one perfect person who did not have a police record. They had no fear that he was going to turn against them and and kill them or stab them. They only feared him because he was the king of kings. And yet no one ever wants to talk about how he was beaten. You wonder sometimes, don't you, um, what is... What's more difficult to understand, the cruelty of man or the love of a savior in this? You think, how oh, he's in pain, uh, the blood is running, and, and they mock him, and they jeer at him. The entire time this goes on, they circle him. He talks about his, his life from birth, and we know that he knew what he was to do. He always knew what he was to do. He had agreed to do what he was to do. He said, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. And we see in Psalm 22, there is a a real description of the pierced hands. We know that, that they were talking about crucifixion. And yet at that time, they did not crucify people. At the time, this psalm was written. In fact, the crucifixion really happened about a thousand years later, It was initiated by the Romans. It was an awful way for anyone to die. And yet, there's a perfect description of the the crucifixion. My strength is dried up. My tongue sticks to my mouth. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me with unholy eyes staring at me. He's naked. And this was real. Well, we know, don't we? about nakedness because God did not want the people to be naked. In fact, the first Adam made us all naked, really, and exposed, and God covered us, covered him. But Jesus became naked so we could be clothed with righteousness. And I, I, I love it that, this, that it got dark so that they couldn't sit there and watch this naked body because I know that that was humiliating, not only for him but for his mother and for anyone there. It was a humiliating thing. And he said, I can count all my bones. And you know when you're crucified, I was reading this the other day, and he had his arms out wide for us. Remember that. Whenever you see him, you know that those arms were out so that he could embrace us if we would come. But when he is on the cross, the body slumps like this, and the chest comes forward, and it pulls every bone out of joint. Every bone out of joint. It's the the weight of the body that does it. And as he looked down, he could see his rib cage. He could count the ribs. He could count the rib that that God had taken from Adam to make Eve. He could just see it all, his whole creation. And in all this time, Jesus Christ did not call for justice. And that's another reason you know that this is a psalm of Jesus Christ. You know that. Because, because even in David's psalms, he wanted the people to be punished for what they had done. He doesn't call for that. He says, forgive them. They know not what they do. He says, I'll declare your name. And he's going to come back again. And he is going to declare the name of God in all the congregation. And he goes on. He talks about the nation of Israel. And he talks about how important it is for all of us to hear about the fullness of God. Now, we need to talk 
about the victory of God. We need to have hope. When uh, uh, Tammy was saying yesterday, and in, in when we were in uh, our class, she said, uh, how, what do you feel when you read these things? What do you feel? How do you feel about it? And she said, I just read the end of the book. I just turned to Revelation. And, and that's what we need to do once in a while. Just read that last chapter or two, or all the whole book if you want. But just know that, you know, this is all going to be over. And we want to be there with him when it's all over. That's a major thing. And um, then he says, the ends of the earth will remember. And we know that all the knees will bow before him. We know that. That that's a certainty. That's a certainty. And in his death, everything, everything was made sin. That was sin of our lives without him ever taking on any sinfulness. And yet he turns in this thing where he knows the separation from the Father. He knows what is going to happen. He knows his Father is turning his back for the first time in all, all of time. And yet in that time, he's talking about saving other people, forgiving other people, and finally for calling out for us to come and then to be there to praise God with him. It's beautiful. Finally, he says, as he's proclaimed the king in verse 30, he says, they will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. And in the Hebrew, those words, he has done it, simply means it is finished. Those were his expiring words. They were his, his words of uh, inspiring words and expiring words. It is finished. And I looked back uh, when I woke up last night. I got thinking. I thought, this is going to be the worst lecture I've ever given. Lord, it's probably the most important. They're always important when they talk about his death. They always are, and his resurrection. They are the most important. Because that's something we can't forget. We have to, we have to keep that in front of us. And, and about 2.48, God said, uh, wake up, and I will tell you what to tell them. And he said, tell them this. Tell him it's not that he died. Everyone is going to die. We will all take our last breath one day. It's not that he was crucified. Many people were crucified. But they didn't count for our salvation. It's not that he was humiliated. Many people are humiliated for God. It's not that he experienced agony and pain because many people are martyred. Most of the disciples were. And they experienced agony and pain. It's not that he could count his bones and they were all out of joint and that he was naked and he was all those things. But those things have happened to other people. It's not what he did. It's who he was and who he is and will always be. That God came himself for us. The way he died was awful. But the way he came was wonderful. And he did it because he loved us. When all things are over, when everything is over, when Project Earth is finished and the creation is gone, the coming of Jesus has come, the Holy Spirit has come, plus all the other things that God has done, all the works that God has done, the marvelous, wonderful works he has done, when those are all done, do you know what Jesus Christ is going to get out of it all? He's not going to get silver. He's not going to get gold. He's not going to get the art or the music or the beautiful chairs or the BMWs or the houses in the, in the, the desert. Or he's not going to get money and he's not going to get beautiful things. Do you know what he's going to get? People. That is the most amazing thing. All he wanted was us.
short people, fat people, thin people, tall people, old people, wrinkled people, new people, funny people, lazy people, perfectionists, some people who don't care about perfectionism and they just want to have a good time, laid back people, controlling people. He's going to get us. And that's what he wanted. And that to me is the most amazing thing about the cross. That he did it for a bunch of people like us. We don't want to miss that. You know, I, I believe probably everyone in here has received Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. But if you haven't, I want to tell you, do it. Do it now. Do it today. Don't leave this place. There's nothing fancy about this place. You don't have to do it here. You can do it anywhere. But decide right now you're going to say, hey, you're going to, you showed your grace to me, Lord, today. Oh, I can't believe this. You died for me. Look at me. Look at me. I can't believe that. But you did. And you want me to receive you as my Savior. You want to live in my heart? It's probably full of cholesterol or whatever that stuff is. You want to live in there? Come on in. You want to run my life? Come on in. Run it. And bring me to this place, Lord Jesus, where I will want to do your will. And so when the day comes that you don't have any gold and you don't have any silver and you don't have a BMW or a Mercedes, you don't have any of that stuff, and all you got's me, you're going to say, what's he going to say? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on in. Let's pray. Oh, Father, don't let one person get away from here if they don't know you. Please trip them, knock them down, drag them back. Send your spirit after them and just keep them as close to you as you can, Father. Because if that's the only thing that came out of today, it would be enough for my lifetime. And, Father, it was enough for your lifetime, wasn't it? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We ran over, but thank you.